けど、曲の。ああ、そう。ああ、じゃ、じゃ、じゃ、じゃ、じゃ。そうだよね。そうか、そうか、そうか、そうか、そうか。そうか、そうか、そうか。そうか、そうか、そうか。そうか、そうか、そうか。そうか、そうか、そうか。そうか、そうか、そうQuindi se riuscite a parlare da qui è meglio, è meglio perché così si sì, vede. Sì, Comunque la webcam è qua e lì chi viene qui a relatare a suonare è sempre come qua. Allora, buongiorno, eh, non lo so, eh, cioè, italiano va bene o no? So we speak in English, in English? Okay, so let me say first of all many thanks uh, to Roberto Caputo for uh, visiting us. Um, he gave this seminar, very interesting seminar about practice, what not. And many thanks to you, uh, the people coming from, from Milano and from other places to meet us for seminar. Uh, many thanks also to people who helped me fill up uh, and to your uh, National Institute of Optics or CML. CSMP, which is the um, um, something that has been built by the University of Brescia to foster uh, uh, collaborations between universities and, uh, and uh, industry, local industries. Um, okay, so let's start with the seminar. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, our, our speaker. So, Roberto, uh, correct me if I say something wrong, he graduated at the University of Calabria. And uh, he has also his PhD there. And then he moved uh, two, to have two years uh, with uh, Marie Curie. Uh, actually, he, he moved for two years to Netherlands. Yeah. And then uh, he used his Marie Curie as uh, something to come back to Calabria, where he is now an uh, assistant professor. And he's very well known for his contributions in this field. So we are looking forward to hear what he's going to say. And I think he's going to speak for about something like 25 minutes. I think during the talk or after, uh, but this is the setup for the, for the talk. Yeah, thank you very much, please. Okay, thank you very much, Costantino, for your kind invitation. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And uh, I hope you will like our studies on active plasmonics. And uh, as uh, Costantino said, my uh, original place is uh, University of Calabria. And uh, before proceeding with the, with the talk, I would like to give some little details about the University of Calabria because initially it, it was a very small university uh, considered as a typical American campus, but then the great uh, uh, demand of uh, high culture in Calabria transformed this university in a medium-sized university of about 26 thousand students at the moment and uh, the, the morphology of the university is very particular because it's kind of a bridge a long bridge of two kilometers the uh, structures are, are on the sides and where are all the departments we have 13 departments including uh, humanities science engineering <coughs> and uh, as you can see the, the bridge is quite long as I said it's about two kilometers and uh, the Laboratory where I come from is uh, located in the Department of Physics at the University of Calabria, and we have uh, four main lines of uh, research. Historically, we worked very much on soft matter applications, 
in uh, polymer composite uh, systems because our group is historically devoted to liquid crystals and polymer composites. And uh, since 2009, we moved to plasmonics and we tried to combine our uh, background expertise with the plasmonics, trying to obtain uh, active plasmonic systems, but we also work on uh, metamaterials. At the moment, we are oriented on the precision nanomedicine in collaboration with many groups in the United States also. And uh, as, you will, uh, as you will see during the talk, we work quite a lot on uh, active plasmonics and thermal plasmonics. So let's switch back to the outline of this talk. As I said, the I main idea is to uh, introduce active plasmonics to you today and uh, why we want to uh, work on active plasmonics. We will explore several mechanisms for inducing active plasmonics like electrical thermal tunability of uh, the uh, plasmonic resonance of, of uh, nanoscale system, but also uh, new possibilities in, in uh, mechanical tuning of the resonance, what we call plasma mechanics. And uh, there is also a final part, which is a, an, a, an additional idea of using plasmonics to generate a poly nanopolymerization or precision nanopolymerization. And this study has been uh, ma made in uh, collaboration with the University of Troyes in France. So let's go back to our talk. So uh, I think many of you are familiar with plasmonics, but uh, Many of you probably don't know that plasmonics is, is very ancient. And uh, this is a typical exam example of this uh, uh, old time. Plasmonics is the Lycurgus cup, which is a, an experiment made by Romans in which they realized this uh, magnificent uh, cup, which is uh, of one color when it is considered uh, with the light inside it. In, so in transmission, you see the cup red and in reflection you will see it's green. So this is the, the principle of plasmonics where you have nanoparticles which selectively absorb uh, light and uh, uh, in transmission you see the light which passes through and in reflection the light which is re essentially reflected. So plasmonics was applied also in, um, in the very nice stained glasses of a cathedral in France or in other places in the world where these very nice colors are not painted but are due to the presence of nanoparticles, meta nanoparticles in the glass. So the presence of these nanoparticles gives these colors. So it's a physical color, not a real color. So uh, when we go more, when we move more to the nanoscale, we can introduce what is a plasmonic resonance in principle, when external light illuminates nanoscale systems, there is a, a, the electronic cloud, the conduction cloud of the particles, tries to follow the incident light, and you have a deformation uh, of this electronic cloud, which generates the absorption which we are speaking about. So this is very nice, because at the nanoscale, these nanoparticles have different colors depending on their size, shape, and uh, uh, the way they are uh, assembled. So clusters of particles will have different colors of a single particle. And uh, why we want to study plasmonics? Because there are many possibilities in uh, uh, photonics, medicine, biology, um, chemistry. And uh, in particular, it's very interesting because the nanoparticles, when we are, they are very close to each other, they show a particular behavior, which is called uh, plasmonic coupling. So there is an overlap of the electronic cloud of the particles, which generates a, a shift of the plasmonic resonance of the single particle. So we will see this in more detail during this seminar because this is the, the core of uh, one of the ways we use, some mechanisms we use for inducing plasmonic, active plasmonics. And uh, very nice, uh, the idea that incident light is uh, absorbed by these particles makes possible a lot of uh, uh, application in light confinement at the nanoscale. 
So in principle, the light which is absorbed by these particles is uh, confined at the nanoscale and creates very high electric fields. You can use these fields in many possibilities for science and technology. So the basic idea behind active plasmonic is that we, we want to control, unfortunately the, the, there is some difference with respect to the initial presentation because it was in another form, but in any way, what we want to do is to apply some macroscale uh, excitation to our system and obtain a nanoscale uh, system, variation at the nanoscale. So how we can do that? There are many possibilities to make active plasmonics. In principle, we can modify the uh, resonance, the plasmonic resonance of our system by using electric fields, temperature, mechanical action, optical field, or even piezo electricity. In the following, we will explore some of these mechanisms and we will show what can be done to modify this uh, plasmonic resonance. So, the main way to modify the plasmonic resonance is that, uh, according to me, we have that the, oh, sorry, the extinction cross section of our system contains the surrounding medium uh, of the typical system we are considering. So in this formula, we see that there is this epsilon m, which represents the dielectric constant of the medium surrounding our system. So as you can see, because this, uh, this constant is at the denominator of this equation, if you change this value, in principle, you are going to change the extinction cross-section of your material. And uh, if the material you use to surround the particles is tunable, so, so you can change the dielectric constant of that material, in principle, you can in influence the resonance of your system. So this is the basic way to obtain active plasmonics. And this is what we started exploring in uh, 2009. As I said, we started switching from typical photonics to plasmonics. And uh, we used as a surrounding medium what was the natural medium for us because we, come, we are a community studying liquid crystals. So the basic medium was liquid crystals because it's uh, an extraordinary uh, medium for uh, changing the uh, refractive index of the material surrounding the particles. So the main uh, way we started was by using what we were good doing until that point. So uh, this very nice structure, which is on the micro scale, is uh, essentially a diffraction grating, which contains liquid crystals. So this uh, uh, system has been studied uh, by our group for in the last 15 years. And uh, the nice property of this uh, system is that you can control the uh, diffraction efficiency, if you consider this system as a diffraction grating, by applying an electrical field, external electrical field, because you can reorient the liquid crystal contained in these very nice channels. So this picture is between cross polarizers, so this is the reason why you can see just the liquid crystal in the, within the structure. So, as I said, this is my background. We use this system for making different uh, applications like uh, wave retarders, interference filters, tunable. All, everything you see in these slides is tunable. So this, uh, this is our tradition to make tunable objects. And uh, this is quite relevant because we tried to make a micro laser emission from a diffraction grating by using a particular kind of uh, liquid crystal, which is a polyesthetic liquid crystal, doped with uh, fluorophores, with uh, dye molecules. So, uh, in principle, by uh, pumping this structure with a, a green laser, you can obtain emission, lasing emission, from each channel of the structure. So this is uh, quite relevant because, uh, also in this case, you can tune the color of the single uh, channel and you can even uh, control single channels uh, separately. So uh, 
The idea to move to plasmonics by using our background in photonics came in 2009 with the participation to a European project. The name is Nanobo. And uh, there was the idea to create uh, clusters of nanoparticles which could have a very particular, uh, very strong uh, plasmonic resonance. So the idea of, of uh, my friend and colleague Carsten Rochstu, who is now in uh, Karlsruhe, was to aggregate uh, meta atoms to create original uh, uh, structures, in particular meta materials with uh, tailored uh, functions. So there were different ways to obtain uh, these uh, uh, meta materials with uh, meta atoms like a uh, unit cell. One way was to have uh, this uh, homogeneous distribution um, of the meta atoms. The other way was to make more ordered systems. So when we uh, came across this kind of scheme, we immediately thought about combining our politics ratings with plasmonics. So the idea to enter the project was exactly in this uh, experimental direction. So what, uh, what we did was just to try to combine with crystals, different nanoparticles, and try to obtain this uh, new kind of metamaterial. And uh, the preliminary step to, to get in this kind of uh, system was to modify, slightly modify the uh, polyclick structures by uh, removing the original liquid crystal and uh, infiltrate new liquid crystal dots with metal nanoparticles. So we uh, elaborated a procedure for washing away the original liquid crystal by solvent and we, we succeeded because in, indeed you are able to, to get a polymeric template that you can afterwards fill in with the liquid crystal dots with the nanoparticles. So the first experiments were made with the cholesteric liquid crystals, which are liquid crystals which have a particular organization, like helicoidal organization, and uh, we dot this material with uh, nanoparticles. And uh, this is what a polyclix gradient becomes when you uh, infiltrate it with this kind of liquid crystal dots with the nanoparticles. This is a, an SEM backscatter image which confirms the presence, the massive presence of uh, uh, metal nanoparticles. And this system has uh, uh, some remarkable uh, plasmonic properties because indeed when you apply an electric field to the system, you modify the orientation of the liquid crystal and in some way you have the first example of active plasmonics because the liquid crystal in this case is the surrounding medium of the particles and what you get is this kind of shift which is not very remarkable, it's about 18 nanometers but the nice point is, is that it still is uh, controllable externally by an energy field and it's also reversible. When you change the temperature of the system, the shift is more remarkable, about 50 nanometers, because the liquid crystal tends to go to the isotropic phase. So it starts from a cholesteric phase. By increasing the temperature, it loses order and changes its uh, refractive index. And in practice, you modify uh, the surrounding medium again to get this very nice uh, shift. So this was the preliminary uh, result obtained in uh, 2011 and we started working that direction also with another approach. Another approach was just to fix the nanoparticles on a substrate and uh, layer the substrate with the liquid crystals. So in principle we changed uh, in a noticeable way the approach because in the previous attempt the liquid crystals contains the nanoparticles. In this case, the, the nanoparticles are fixed to the substrate and you can layer it with uh, liquid crystals. So, in a few words, what happens is that you can also in this way modify, actively modify the resonance position by applying a, an external field. The point is that in this case, there is the creation of an accumulation layer at the interface between the glass and the ITO 
uh, layer which is on top of the, of the glass for applying the fields. This is a competing mechanism of tuning because this accumulation layer creates a change, a local change of the re refractive index, which is uh, competing with the change of the refractive index of the liquid crystals. So we obtain what we define the kind of dancing behavior because in some way by increasing the uh, electric field we don't have a linear response of the resonance but a change in a red shift and a blue shift uh, depending on the applied field. This was some, uh, some result we didn't investigate uh, more in detail because we changed in, uh, in the following uh, the uh, mechanism of obtaining a field plasmonics. In particular, we started moving on another possibility. So uh, the idea was to use the same distribution of nanoparticles we had on a glass, but to make this uh, distribution on a flexible substrate. So we started using PDMS and we obtained what is represented here. As you can see, the plasmonic color of the material is very well visible but the particles are just on the substrate, on the surface of the substrate, not in the bar. And uh, this is uh, some work we made in collaboration with Professor Burghi in Geneva. And uh, in the last five years, we are collaborating in this direction because it is very promising for many kinds of applications. In particular, by using liquid crystals, the point is that uh, the surface is uh, in some way layered with the liquid crystals, so it is difficult to combine the material with other uh, systems like biological, for example. On this way, uh, on the contrary, you have the nanoparticles on the substrate, on the surface, and you can put whatever you like uh, eventually to, to use the resonance or the resonance shift in a fruitful way. So the first experiments are, are um, not very difficult to understand what's going on. Indeed, in principle, okay, I just open all the animations so it will be simpler. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's the one. Oh. So, if you have a flexible substrate, in principle, if you elongate it in one direction, you tend to uh, decrease the size in the direction orthogonal to the elongation. And if you have an elastic material with a Poisson coefficient of 0 0.5 in principle, if you elongate 10 in one direction, you will compress 5 in the perpendicular direction. So what really happens is that all the particles which <coughs> happen to stay in the direction perpendicular to elongation tends to go close to each other. So the point was that if you put the particles to a close distance, you have a, a plasmonic coupling, what I said uh, before. So you have uh, some overlap of the electronic clouds of the particles, which generates a redshift of the plasmonic resonance. And you can control this uh, distance by just elongating the substrate. So it's very easy to, to do. The only point was that if you, your particles start from a distance which is very large, even if you apply your elongation and uh, consequent compression, they don't go very close to each other. So the point was to try to grow locally the nanoparticles before making the experiment. So with a chemical procedure, this is possible, and this is what we did. So in principle, by growing the particles, you start from a kind of pre-coupling condition between them, and when you stretch the material, they go very, very close to each other and induce the coupling you want. So this is the example of, of the sample without growing and with growing procedure. And uh, you can see that the color of the sample, the macroscopic uh, image, uh, changed because here, in this case, the particles are uh, bigger in, in a way and they are also closer. So in some way you have a different color because there is a, this pre-coupling condition. So when we go to the real experiment, uh, this is what we obtain at rest. The sample shows one color. When you stretch it, the color is different. So in principle, by elongating the sample, you change its color. And uh, the experiment is quite simple and uh, reversible. 
And uh, here, there are more quantitative results. You can see that you have a very nice shift of the resonance in this time, uh, because this corresponds to a real change of power. And it's about 80 nanometers for the polarization of the light, the exciting polarization, which is perpendicular to the elongation. When you consider the other uh, polarization with, along the stretching direction, in principle, what happens is that the nanoparticles don't get coupled because they go away from each other. So uh, if you consider this other polarization along the stretching direction, you just have a decrease of the amplitude of the plasma resonance. This is due to the fact that, in principle, you illuminate less particles when you are going to stretch them. So, as I said, this is quite reversible, and uh, uh, we remained in our uh, stretching condition in the elastic uh, behavior of the substrate. So, this is the real video of the sample. As you can see, the, the change of color is uh, quite visible. And, uh, of course, as I said, it's quite reversible. So, you can stretch it many, many times without problems. Of course, if the substrate breaks uh, for too much uh, elongation, you don't have it anymore. So, we also tried to compare these results with the typical plasma ruler equation because we expect that when we are in a coupling regime, the, the change of resonance is, uh, follows an exponential behavior. And uh, we can show here that the sample of subrest uh, follow this line until a certain point, but when you repeat the, the same experiment uh, and you calculate the ratio between the gap and the size of the particle, in principle you can get this very high uh, change of, uh, of resonance, this very nice shift that is uh, following quite well the, what is expected of you. And um, we tried to to numerically uh, explain this behavior, and indeed, uh, by just considering the coupling, you can find quite theoretical uh, behaviors which are very similar to the experimental one. Of course, in this case, the gaps we are considering are very small, but uh, in the simulation, it was not considering the presence of the substrate. So, in practice, uh, there is some discrepancy, but. Uh, the general qualitative behavior is quite impressive. Oh, okay, so how to use this? The, the, the first idea you get is to make kind of deformation sensor, a, a tensile, uh, tensile sensor. So the point is about the sensitivity of this uh, system because when we showed the experiment, we used 20% uh, of uh, elongation, which is quite large for a sensor. So. If you want to improve the sensitivity uh, of this sensor, of this material as a sensor, you should apply some uh, uh, possibility like, uh, first of all, okay, first of all, change the size, the initial size of the particles because the plasmonic field will be longer range and uh, you have a better sensitivity. Another possibility is to uh, move from a random distribution of particles to order one where you have more control what you want to couple, let's say, which particles they are going to couple. So in the last period we are working, we are performing some simulations to optimize this kind of uh, response. And uh, of course, for industry needs, you have to maximize the size of these uh, ordered samples. So we are in, in collaboration with the group in Germany uh, where they are able to immobilize the particles in an ordered way on the substrate and we predict to have a very nice results in the, in the following for this kind of activity. But uh, what is uh, more remarkable is that when you uh, illuminate your particles, the particles generate heat. This is a typical uh, thermoplasmonic response of the particles because the, they absorb this energy and in some way they need to dissipate it. With, so with uh, several mechanisms, they go to real heat dissipation. So the idea to produce uh, heat at the nanoscale can be very important for biological medical experiments. And 
we started working recently in this direction and uh, of course we needed to make some literature search before starting and uh, you can easily find that uh, okay the, the single particle does not produce very much heat but when you have many of them uh, you can uh, easily maximize the effect because there is a collective effect um, thermal effect from the particles but uh, more interesting is that uh, if you have a couple of particles like in the case we saw before during the stretching action the uh, result is much more efficient so in principle if by using deformation you induce a thermoplasmonic response by coupling you can have a much more effect in, uh, in terms of uh, heat generation and to, we try to use this by considering the previous system just under a thermoplasmonic point of view so well, it's uh, quite easy to understand the, the kind of applications you could have for, from these systems because of course you can uh, with the thermoplasmonics you can make uh, a med a nanomedicine uh, you can burn simply uh, cancerous cells for example or you can have uh, by using the thermoplasmonic response uh, drug release in uh, certain points from particles just by functionalizing the particle with the uh, uh, medicines or other possibilities it's just on the imagination of uh, who works on this so what hap really happens on the nanoscale when you consider the uh, different distributions of nanoparticles the, as I said, the thermal effect is a collective effect. So if you increase the density of particles or change the size, you can have a different thermal behavior. This is what we did. And uh, by changing from one density of particles to another, you have uh, different behaviors in the, in the thermal response of the system. Here, for example, we have the intensity of pumping and on the vertical axis we have the change of temperature with respect to the room temperature so as we can see this depends on the on the density of the particles the effect you can get is changed for example from a maximum of 23.5 to 27 but uh, another way to change the thermal response is for example by changing the refractive index surrounding of the medium surrounding the particles because in some way you can isolate the particles from uh, the external ambient and uh, increase their uh, thermal efficiency but uh, what we wanted to do is uh, just to control this phenomenon in an active way so as, as we said the, the temperature absolute temperature of the system can depend from the single particle cross extinction uh, cross section or from the excitation intensity or from the number of excited particles but if you fix these parameters and you apply uh, an intensity of pumping you will have a given temperature that we call offset temperature but uh, when you induce a coupling between particles by means of an external uh, mechanical action you can uh, modify this temperature in a fine way so this is what we wanted to demonstrate and uh, we can see in the following that there are two possible controls there is a mechanical strain uh, control or a light polarization control let's see this in detail so this is the experiment we performed uh, as you can see the, this is not a very refined setup but it worked quite well we just plumped our sample uh, at its extremities and then we applied the mechanical strain with uh, some uh, um, precision translators so uh, the idea is that you you have uh, you can perform an extinction uh, experiment while pumping your your sample and we can see as an experimental uh, result the change in the cross extinction uh, of the sample um, by applying different um, pump intensity so, so these, these are, are the real results, results. Uh, you, you can, can see, see some, some similarities, similarities 
uh, with the previous experiments where we just monitored the position of the plasmonic resonance. And uh, in particular, if you use a pumping excitation which is parallel to the uh, stretching direction, nothing really happens. Uh, so you can change the intensity of pumping, but by stretching, in principle, you uh, keep the same temperature. Constant temperature, there is no change of temperature by stretching if you use uh, pumping polarization along the stretching direction. The situation is much different when instead you use a polarization which is perpendicular to the stretching. If you remember, with the um, polarization perpendicular to the stretching, we had the very efficient uh, resonance shift. This resonance shift, in principle, corresponds uh, to a change of temperature fine control of the temperature of the, of the sample. So in this case, for example, you can change by just stretching from 29 to about 40 degrees. So you have a, a range of change which is quite uh, useful. Imagine that, uh, okay, the next step we want to do with this kind of system is to induce precision biological reaction on the surface by just controlling the the elongation of the sample by pumping always with the same ladder intensity but changing the uh, applied strain you can modify the temperature the local temperature and then eventually uh, induce some biological reaction so we wanted to model this system and uh, it was not very easy because we start from a homogeneous a uniform uh, distribution but which is not regular. So uh, use, uh, study a random distribution of particles by COMSOL was not the ideal point. And uh, moreover, the next step is to, to abandon the uniform uh, random distribution for something which is more ordered, because when it is ordered, you can engineer in some way the position of the hotspots and the, the, the places where the temperature will be higher when you apply your strain. So we started considering this kind of cluster of particles, which is in some way similar to the real one, if you, if you have a look to this uh, part of this SEM uh, picture. But uh, in principle, we tried to save some conditions which could, be, uh, could give some reliability to our results. So in particular, the point is that uh, without stretching, you need to have uh, the same spectra if you uh, consider this or this polarization, so vertical or uh, horizontal polarization. And uh, this is true in this case because the sample is, uh, the sample is just central symmetric. Then, of course, we wanted to uh, keep the average distance uh, on a reasonable way with respect to the real case and we consider that uh, the realization of this uh, sample in uh, an experimental way is due to the um, to a kind of electrostatic problem. Because we functionalize the surface and uh, we'll acquire a given charge and the particles themselves are charged but with opposite sign. So they tend to uh, go away from each other during the, the position but at the same time, they are attracted by the substrate. So this is not exactly a random distribution of particles, if you think about that, because we have kind of uh, electrostatic interaction that generates the result. So at the end, we gave a kind of average distance between all the particles of this uh, uh, numerical cluster to respect the, the real case. So by making the first uh, simulations, we observed that indeed you can uh, find what was uh, in, in a qualitative way, at least the experimental behavior. So you observe a stretch, uh, a, a, a shift of the resonance when you pump with the polarization perpendicular to the stretching direction. And at the same time, you don't see any difference at rest. So the two, spectra are the same. So this is compared to the experimental case. When we consider the uh, field maps of the system at rest and under stretching for the different polarization, 
you can see that uh, indeed there is a very similar field of course at rest but uh, the situation is much different when you consider instead the stretched configuration so with the the um, polarization along the stretching, we obtain a, a value which is quite similar to the original one at rest. And uh, in the perpendicular direction, instead we obtain a, a value which is about three times the original one. This is to say that uh, indeed, uh, what we observed experimentally, that the change of um, cross, uh, extinction cross session of the system is uh, negligible when you consider the polarization uh, along the stretching and very different when you consider the polarization perpendicular is compared also numerically. But when we move to the uh, thermal uh, behavior of the system in the same conditions, so at rest or under stretching with different polarizations, you can see indeed a very uh, high uh, increase of temperature, local temperature in the stretched condition. This is to confirm that uh, indeed in the experimental case when you stretch you have uh, an increase of temperature, general increase of temperature of the, of the sample. We tried to make, oh I'm sorry for this because I think the change to PowerPoint didn't work very much, but in principle this, sli uh, this slide is to say that if you consider, if you make a proportion between the field you use for the experimental case and the one that we used in the numerical simulation, uh, proportion is made with the number of particles that you expect to have in the experimental uh, sample and in the numerical case, uh, in principle you get the same change, increase of temperature, uh, almost the same increase of temperature in the numerical and experimental case, consider, um, giving some kind of confirmation, quantitative confirmation also to the result. Okay, uh, I'm going to the final part of this talk. As I said, uh, the, there was an attempt to use plasmonics to, to make nanoscale photopolymerization. This work has been made uh, in uh, collaboration with the University of Troyes. And in principle, uh, this is very important for other applications and uh, uh, can be useful for uh, precision nanopolymerization. Uh, as you can see, when you have a dipolar excitation of a nanoparticle, in principle you, you obtain very intense fields uh, at, the, at the border of the particle. So if you uh, cover this particle with a material which is polymer, uh, polymerizable by an electric field, uh, you could create the replica of the field by uh, inducing polymerization only in those areas where the field is very high. So, if your material is under threshold everywhere because the field is uh, typically low, uh, but is uh, over th threshold in the proximity of the particle, you can create this polymerized replica of the field. So you can, uh, in principle, uh, have a, a permanent uh, image of what was the field around the particle. So. The real experiment has been performed in a, in a different way. So we didn't want just to use a polymer uh, to create this uh, field replica, but a polymer doped with uh, four pores, with quantum dots in particular, of different power. And uh, we made this procedure two times, uh, first in one direction, of the, the pores uh, of the polymer are artificial, just to distinguish where it is. And uh, the first time has been made in this direction, the second time in this direction, on the same sample, and uh, you get these lobes, these polymer lobes of different colors in principle, and that can give rise to uh, nanometers with, uh, where you can control the emission uh, wavelengths. So, as I said, this work has been performed uh, with many groups, in collaboration with many groups, including the group of Professor Xiao Wei San in uh, uh, China. And uh, as you can see, by changing the illumination polarization, you can observe the different emission color, uh, depending which kind of lobes are, you are exciting. So the, at the end, the, 
the system is green for one polarization and red for another one. So in conclusion, as I showed you, the, we explored some possibilities in uh, active plasmonics. And in particular, we started by considering what is the effect of surrounding medium around plasmonic nanoparticles. Then we switched to another kind of mechanism for inducing active plasmonics, which is the uh, mechanical action. And uh, initially, this was just uh, an idea to shift the resonance, but uh, we started using this in a more fruitful way by just by just uh, studying the thermal response of the system by changing the, um, the elastic uh, reaction of the substrate. And finally, uh, we showed these new possibilities for using plasmonics in a more uh, different way, but uh, uh, eventually very important at the nanoscale. Okay, the, these are uh, some of the groups we work uh, in collaboration on. And in particular, I would like to underline the collaboration with Professor Giuseppe Strangi, who is uh, uh, now a full professor in our university and uh, will soon start more, in, in, uh, more focusing on uh, nanomedicine, uh, precision nanomedicine with plasmonics. And uh, in particular, also with Professor Alexander Gogorov, who is very skilled in uh, thermoplasmonics. He's supposed to come uh, to our group in, for a week in June. We would like to increase our collaboration. And with many other groups that you have uh, came across during this call. Uh, finally, I would like to underline that we will be at the Pierce 2019 with a focus session on uh, hybrid and uh, plasmonic metastructures. And we are the organizing committee also of the NOMA conference, what we call NOMA, Novel Optical Materials and Application Conference, which is held in, uh, in Calabria every two years since, uh, I think, uh, year 1998. And uh, you are welcome to, to come and visit us to this conference. And of course, I thank you all for the kind attention. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, something like that uh, is the topic of our discussions with uh, Costantino in, in the last 24 hours, I would say. So I think this is the next step. We should start trying exploring the nonlinear properties of the plasmonic response in uh, systems like this. I think there is high potential and uh, uh, we, we are considering also uh, layering uh, nanoparticles uh, or other systems that Costantino and uh, you are studying with uh, tunable materials like a particular kind of liquid crystals that we are working with. And uh, I think there are uh, exciting opportunities for this. Thank you very much for your question. I think this one, okay. Yeah, you are, you mentioned the uh, uh, radio neutron beam of the radio wave. Yep. And then you don't talk about the other applications of the thermal properties uh, of the... Uh, okay, yes, indeed, uh, there are two steps. 
we first uh, numerically simulated the um, plasmonic response in terms of extinction cross sections and calculated the corresponding field maps. And then the obtained field maps are uh, considering in terms of uh, thermal behavior by using a um, console module for uh, simple head, uh, heat dissipation by the system. So we just used the heat uh, diffusion equation for calculating this, uh, this uh, heat response, thermal response of the system. I, I don't know if I answered your question, but... Range. Okay, there are many ways to do this. In principle, by keeping the same particles, you could increase the pumping uh, uh, intensity. So you modify what I called an offset temperature, and then you can play around it uh, by simply stretching the sample. So if you need a larger uh, tunability range in temperature, in that case, I think we should change the particles. But if you need, for example, to pass instead of from, from 40 to 50, from 70 to 80, this could be the way. question because uh, uh, you are going, going in a very deep, deep insight on, on the, on the situation. situation because okay for answering your first question indeed uh, when, when you, you consider this family of curves you have uh, in principle one peak which is decreasing and another peak, peak which is increasing so uh, I explained to myself this uh, situation in the way that uh, in in practice, you have uh, all the particles of your sample uh, working together to, be, uh, to give these peaks. But the particles which are uh, situated um, in vertical, let's say, with respect to the stretching, uh, are, influenced, are influenced in a way because they are coupled to each other. But other particles instead uh, are going away from each other depending how they are located in a between each other. So I suppose there is a family of particles which keeps the original uh, plasmonic behavior because they are simply not coupled between each other and this belong to the first peak. But the, the amount of these particles, one you are going to stretch, decreases and uh, the result is that this peak is also decreasing accordingly. But on the other side, the number of particles which get coupled during the stretching action is also increasing while you increase the stretching. And at a certain point, the, you have uh, an increase of the shifted peak because 
because the number of these particles is larger than before. And uh, there is also an interesting point which is described by this curve, and the matrix can not use it, which is a different color, which is kind of red here at 8.6. And uh, we have a kind of cutoff when the, these two family of particles are more or less uh, equal in, um, in a percentage in the sample. This is at least the way I explain this. For what concerns the allocation? Uh, okay. Uh, we have uh, three possible directions. One is the elongation. In plane, there is another uh, direction, which is the compression. And you should even consider a third one, which is the thinning of the substrate. Because uh, it's, uh, <coughs> okay, you could say Y, X, and Z. So along Z, we should have our uh, substrate more uh, thin during the stretching action. But the point is that uh, mm, I think this should not affect very much the behavior of the system because the particles are on a plane, are on, a, on the surface of the, of the sample. So we just considered the main two directions, the elongation and perpendicular, because they are the most influential ones, I think. Ah, okay. The, the or I, uh, this show there. Yeah. It's really long, right? So I was wondering whether this is... Uh, and in principle, this could be, I've seen some uh, aggregation of particles which takes place. At, at least we observed this one, but we don't know exactly what's going on, uh, honestly, because uh, uh, to control this, probably we should go on the nanoscale, uh, we tried to make and uh, to repeat this experiment in a SEM in Paris, but unfortunately uh, the material is uh, a dielectric, so it was not very easy to to perform the experiment itself. And on the other way, uh, it's not very easy to make the perfect elongation in a SEM because the the stretching machine uh, does not give you all this freedom. But uh, that could be the way to better understand the presence of this shoulder and if, uh, if, this, uh, if it's present. This was like a really tiny step in our uh, distribution, it seems like we don't have this reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is to be investigated in some way. I think it's a peculiar behavior after all. Yeah, the abundance of events maybe somehow reduces the field. Maybe. One reason why we are going to move to ordered distributions is that uh, it's more predictable. Because uh, to predict the behavior of this uh, with a random distribution is not very, very easy. But uh, the main features, at least, uh, I think we, we explained we, which they are. They are, they are. Okay. Indeed, what I said is that um, the point is that they consider just the particles without substrate. And uh, in practice, we don't know if the particles, how much they are embedded in the substrate. So uh, we suppose they are up, embedded up outside. So we, to simulate the real case, you should at least estimate this one. So to avoid uh, many, many problems at the beginning, we just uh, consider the part particles uh, themselves without substrate, and uh, the results are affected by this. Oh, okay, so you mean that uh, basically the distances uh, give just a good enough representation of how much closer that is. Yeah, 
Yeah, the, the, the presence of a medium of between them modifies the uh, resonant response. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay.